It is always scary when someone in your family is being admitted to hospital. Even if it's just for a routine procedure, no one wants to stay longer in a hospital than they have to, and healthcare acquired infections happen all the time. These are infections that immunocompromised patients catch while in hospital and are increasingly caused by superbugs that cannot be killed by any drugs on the market. Prevention is always better than cure. So how do we prevent superbugs from emerging in the first place? If it's your first time here, my name is Jack Wang. I'm a microbiologist, a science educator, and on this channel, we talk about laboratory and communication skills in science and how they can make an impact. Today, we are talking about superbugs, what they are, why they are becoming more common, and how scientists can create a superbug in the lab to better understand this whole process. When I use the term superbug, I'm talking about bacteria that have developed a resistance against a broad range of drugs, namely antibiotics targeted at killing them. Now, some bacteria are just naturally resistant to some antibiotics, and it wasn't a big deal once upon a time. We would simply go to another antibiotic in our arsenal, built up over decades of scientific research and drug discovery. But we're running out of options. It has been years since a brand new category of antibiotic was discovered and bacteria had developed mechanisms to defend against all of them. If you're infected by a superbug, doctors don't have any good options on the table. They can increase the dosage of the antibiotic so much that it becomes toxic for you and your kidneys and liver, or just hope your immune system can fight off the bug by itself. We hear about superbug versions of TB and Staph aureus and E. coli all the time in the news. And it's scary how common it's becoming all across the globe. For a bacteria to become resistant to the drug, it needs to acquire a gene that stops the activity of that drug. Penicillin was the first antibiotic discovered and mass produced by Fleming, Flurry, and Chain. And now there's a whole family of penicillins which share a specific chemical structure, the beta-lactam ring. We call them beta-lactam antibiotics for this reason. They make bacterial cell walls weak and prone to rupturing, which kills the bacteria. Some bacteria have acquired a gene that makes the protein that can break down beta-lactam antibiotics. These enzymes are called beta-lactamases. They bind to the beta-lactam ring and chop up the antibiotic, rendering it useless. Genes and proteins are involved, but how do they spread to different bacteria? Scientists call this horizontal gene transfer, where bacteria move genes to and from each other using a range of different mechanisms. Conjugation transformation or transduction and there's a viral phage involved. If the new gene has no function then those bacteria will grow normally and the new gene doesn't spread very far at all. If the gene provides a survival advantage though those bacteria can grow and replicate faster than normal and naturally that new gene is now present in more bacterial cells. This may sound quite abstract so let's see how scientists have demonstrated this by creating our own safe versions of superbugs in the lab. First, let's replicate the transfer of antibiotic resistance genes between bacterial cells. We pick a colony from a bacterial strain that we know contains an antibiotic resistance gene. In this case, beta-lactamase genes that inactivate beta-lactam antibiotics. We incubate and grow the bacteria in liquid broth culture overnight at 37 degrees Celsius with vigorous shaking, spin down the bacterial cells using a centrifuge, then lies them open to extract all of the DNA inside. At this point, the DNA is a combination of contaminants and that bacteria's entire genome. It's not feasible or normal to move a whole genome between cells. Only a few genes are moved at any one time. To better mimic this process, we will isolate the individual antibody resistance gene. To do this, we need to purify the DNA using commercially available kits. The bacterial cells are not lysed yet. They are spun down or pelleted to the bottom of a tube. The liquid in the tube is called the supernatant at this point, and because all the DNA is stuck inside the cells, we are not interested in the supernatant just yet. We can discard it and follow the instructions in the DNA prep kit to add the right buffers one by one. This will lyse the cells, stop any enzymes from degrading the DNA, remove any cellular debris, and stick any DNA on a membrane embedded in a spin column. The membrane is then washed a number of times to remove contaminants before a specific elution buffer is added to draw out and extract the purified DNA from the membrane down into a collection tube. Once we have the purified DNA, which at this point is all the genomic DNA within the bacterial strain, we need to isolate the actual antibiotic resistance gene. We do this using PCR with primers targeting the start and end of the coding region of the antibiotic resistance gene. You can find out more about PCR in our previous videos, link below. 
but briefly this involves setting up a PCR reaction, doing calculations using the C1 times V1 equals C2 times V2 formula. Pause the video here if you want to have a go yourself. Then we put the tubes into the PCR machine, run it through the cycles, and if it's successful, we should see a band of DNA about the size of the gene using gel electrophoresis. A free-floating piece of linear DNA is difficult to move between bacterial cells, and it's much easier to move circular pieces of DNA or plasmids that are more stable and contain features that allow genes to be expressed into protein. Again, to better mimic the natural process, we must copy the antibiotic resistance gene that we've just amplified using PCR into a plasmid. We've talked about molecular cloning on the channel before, but basically it involves cutting the gene of interest and the plasmid with restriction enzymes, using DNA ligase to stitch them together, and transforming the whole mixture into bacterial cells. This last step, transforming the plasmid containing a new antibiotic resistance gene into other bacteria, is a close approximation of what is happening to superbugs. We can use a classic disc diffusion assay on the transformed bacteria expressing the new genes to see that they are now resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. You can see that the zone of inhibition around the discs is much smaller or non-existent compared to the control, which is the same bacteria that did not take up the plasmid DNA. And there you have it, we've chaperoned the transfer of DNA between bacteria and created a prototype of a superbug. The key to all of this is how we define survival or selective advantage which is largely dependent on the environment you're in. If I'm wearing basketball sneakers designed for running and pivoting on hardwood floors, when I'm playing basketball, I have an advantage over other players on that hardwood court who are maybe wearing sandals or flip-flops. People will realize this and start wearing the shoes that give them the best advantage in that environment and it spreads. If we change the environment, say we're playing on concrete or a slippery grassy field, any advantage I had from wearing those shoes is now gone. The same principle applies in gene transfer. Antibiotic resistance genes are only valuable to the bacteria in an environment constantly surrounded by antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance genes would not spread very far at all if there were no antibiotics in the environment that the bacteria had to defend against. And here is the crux of the superbug problem in a nutshell. We as a society are using too many antibiotics and creating an environment where bacteria need to constantly select and spread genes to help them survive. This is a problem that modern medicine created. We as patients want our doctors to prescribe antibiotics for sore throats, which are actually caused by viruses 70 to 80% of the time. The bacteria targeting antibiotics won't help the sore throat recover, it just amplifies the need for antibiotic resistance genes. As more and more patients undergo surgical operations, hospitals are prescribing more and more antibiotics to prevent their surgical wounds from getting infected. Antibiotics are also prescribed to animals and livestock as a growth promoter so that there is more meat on the bone to be sold to supermarkets. Sure, we can try to invent new types of antibiotics, but we simply cannot keep up with the superbugs. They are evolving at a much faster rate than any R&D project, even ones financed by billion dollar pharma companies. More superbugs will continue appearing, infecting people in the community, as well as patients in hospitals until we find an effective strategy for monitoring and controlling antibiotic misuse. Most people aren't even aware that this is an issue. So it's our job as scientists and science lovers to spread the word. When it comes to science communication to the general public, a little bit goes a long way. It's the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne. See you next time.